here in the heart of Buckinghamshire. This is the National Space Propulsion Test Facility. It's a new capability for vacuum testing of chemical space propulsion thrusters from 100 to 1500 newtons. It's funded and owned by the UK Space Agency, run and operated by NAMO, and managed by the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Hello, my name's Dr. Matt Palmer, and I work here at NAMO as a senior propulsion engineer, and I was the site architect for the National Space Propulsion Test Facility. It's important to be able to test rockets in high altitude conditions. You need to accurately represent the conditions they will face in space. As is always said, it's easy to solve pro problems on the ground, but once in space, you don't have a chance. So we need to make sure everything works effectively and as it should do down here on Earth. And that's why we recreate the conditions of space here within this facility. This world-class vacuum test facility can test engines anything up to 1500 newtons in a high altitude environment. We do that here with a set of mechanical pumps that you can see over to my left-hand side. However, these are just the end of the process. And it all starts back with the rocket engine. So in the test bay, we have our rocket engine within our vacuum test cell. And that's where we take all of the useful data that we need to do this program. And you might have noticed that day site is a, an old concrete bunker, but that's actually designed to absorb 30 kilograms of TNT. So should the engine go wrong, everyone who works around it is nice and protected. The exhaust from the rocket engine comes out at six times the speed of sound. That's several thousand meters per second. The first step is to slow those gases down. We do that in a seven meter long supersonic diffuser. That slows those gases down from several thousand to just 100 meters per second. In the process, we recover a lot of energy in the form of heat. That heat needs to be dissipated very quickly. So the first thing we do is put it inside a very advanced heat exchanger, probably the most advanced heat exchanger in the world. And we cool those gases from over 2000 degrees to less than 50 in just a meter. And it takes 100,000 liters of water, so 100 meters cubes of water through every hour to cool those gases from over 2000 degrees to just 50 in less than a meter. And that's fractions of a second in terms of real time of the flow. And once we're through that, we can then bring them back to the plant here behind me and we can evacuate them back into atmosphere. And we pump through around 60,000 cubic meters of gas every hour. Now there are many ways of achieving a vacuum. We've gone down the mechanical route. And the reason we've done mechanical pumps is they're so much quicker at achieving the performance that we need. We can go down to our vacuum conditions, one millibar in our test cell, in just like about three minutes. And if we have to, we can bring it back up to atmospheric conditions in around 15 minutes. So that means that should there be an issue or should something happen that means we need to access the engine, we can be back up to atmospheric pressure inside doing any changes and modifications required and then back down to vacuum in around half an hour. And that's fantastic because that means for everyone out there, the customers, the minimum downtime that they can expect. So we can be operating for a lot of hours in a working day rather than just a really limited subset of that time. Now in total, it's around 700 kilowatts required to run the facility. And that sounds like a lot of power and it is a lot of power. But the great thing about using a mechanical system is that we can tailor the amount of power being required to the engine that we're testing. So as I said, this facility can do 1500 newtons and when we're running at 1500 newtons, we need all 700 kilowatts of motor power to get those gases out of the system. But if you're running a smaller Apogee engine, say 400 newtons, 500 newtons, we can massively reduce the amount of power we require. And that's all about making it cheaper for the end customer, as well as being more environmentally friendly. All engines need to be tested before we launch them. So every single engine that's manufactured has to be tested to ensure that it operates exactly as we expect. And we have to do that in a representative condition to get the best performance data for the customers and the satellite operators. The test engineers are focused on making sure the engine works. That is their primary focus and ensuring that everything and all the data that they are gathering is the best quality data that the end customer needs. The system is designed to operate by itself. It's a single button to start this facility. And once operational, it monitors 
all of its own conditions. So it's constantly feeding back data to let us know that it is optimally running. If there are problems, it will also let us know. It actually displays error messages and drags the attention of the firing team, but only when it needs to. And the advantage of that is that we can run with a much more efficient team of just two or three people compared to other facilities that require eight or nine to do the same operation. And that is much more cost effective. This facility has been developed to provide high altitude testing capabilities for engines up to 1.5 kilonewtons of thrust while producing test pressures as low as one millibar. This high altitude capability is necessary to verify rocket engine performance under a range of conditions. The facility currently utilises J3 test cell, which is a horizontal firing facility able to operate not only at high altitude, but can also be configured for uh, both sea level and medium altitude. This makes it ideal for support in all phases of rocket engine development, from early stage verification, all the way through to qualification and acceptance hot fire testing. Before going into our 60 second countdown for firing, we communicate with a safety officer located off site. They review the CCTV system and give us the all clear to go into our hot fire test. We then go into a 60 second countdown where we start instrumentation recording, complete any final checks and also set up our conditioning for our uh, propeller inlet temperatures. We then arm up the system go into our final six second countdown into our hot fire test. Once the hot fire test is complete, we're able to collect all of the hot fire test data and pass that securely to the customer to take away with them. The National Space Pulsion Test Facility has its own bespoke software, and this provides full control over the vacuum pumps and the cooling system. Also takes data from various parts of the system, so from the diffuser, the plume intercooler, the vacuum pumps, and the cooling tower. It uses this data to continuously monitor the health of the system. Full parameters in range, a safe to arm signal is sent to the J3 firing bay, allowing the engine to be armed ready for firing. The interface is designed to only attract the attention of the firing team if parameters move out of predefined limits. So initially a warning is raised. If parameters continue to move further out of range, the system alarms. This removes the safe to arm signal, um, terminates any firing that may be taking place, puts the site into a safe state. This autonomy allows the firing team to focus on the engine under the test, therefore minimises the number of personnel required to run the facility. The J3 facility also has its own software for controlling the site. We've got our propellant control software. This provides control over the valves in the propellant feed system. Also allows us to set and regulate propellant tank pressures. We've got auxiliary control software. This allows us to control the propellant inlet temperatures uh, to carry out the in situ calibration of the load cell and it also allows us to control the systems associated with the medium altitude configuration of the site. We've also got our data acquisition system and real-time engine monitoring software. This allows during a firing for us to see at a glance if we're in spec on key parameters, such as total mass flow rate, mixture ratio, final feed pressure, and inlet temperatures. We've got two thermal imaging cameras, as well as an optical camera, all looking at the engine under test, giving us a full 360 degree view of the engine. And we've also got uh, CCTV systems looking at the whole site as well as in the individual propellant and firing bays. The J3 vacuum chamber allows the testing of engines up to one metre in length and with an exit diameter of up to half a metre. The chamber includes both water-cooled heat shields and baffles. And this acts to both protect the chamber during extended firings and it also results in the engine radiator onto a fixed temperature, allowing for easier comparisons between test data and thermal models. The thrust stand is a classical suspended pendulum design whereby a central fixed mass is surrounded by a moving frame to which the engine is mounted. To maximise the accuracy and stability of thrust measurement, both the thrust stand and load cell are temperature conditioned and we're also able to carry out in situ calibration of the load cell immediately prior to a firing. The engine interface panel provides all of the necessary interfaces between the feed system and the engine, so its main job is to provide clean, filtered, temperature conditioned pellet to the engine to allow for decontamination of the propellant lines. And it also provides the necessary engine instrumentation such as final feed pressure and inlet temperature. The rear of the chamber incorporates seven ports which can be used for thermal and optical cameras. This provides a full coverage of the engine under test.